Now for our story. The train bearing the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Ben Calvert, moved slowly through the outskirts of Los Angeles. The former Jessie Ward, her hat becoming, her gloved hands clasped neatly in her lap, sat across from her husband, looking out at the scene which moved slowly past the window. It was night, and in the darkness, the lighted factories and plants assumed a mysterious fairy-like quality. This was the end of Jessie's honeymoon trip, a honeymoon which was a mockery. And yet Jessie dreaded to see the journey end. When she'd made her threat to Ben, she hadn't bargained for a showdown so soon. She'd imagined she could forestall it. But Ben, determined to see his daughter and take matters into his own hands, had demanded Kip's address, and Jessie'd been unable to refuse. Now, anticipating the meeting with Kit and the disclosure of her trickery, it was all Jessie could do to hide her nervousness and fear from Ben's distrustful eyes. But some miles away at Malibu Beach, outside the city, the object of Jessie's fears was in an opposite mood. Mrs. Kit Mead this evening was feeling quite pleased with herself. She'd always been able to shape things to her liking until she'd been faced with her husband's attachment to Peggy Douglas. Now she was convinced she could handle that situation. Her fears about her coming baby were no longer so acute. The knowledge that Paul Cromwell still loved her, that she could still influence him, had been a great lift to her ego. She was in the end. She was in the end. She was in the end, no matter what happened. Confident and undefeated, she rather enjoyed the wildness of the wind as she walked slowly back home after leaving Paul's house. A storm was brewing. The living room was lit only by the firelight. She could see Lisa Fenner seated in a low chair, staring into the flames. Lisa, Oh, hello there, Lisa. Oh, Lord, what a night this is going to be. The weather doesn't seem to have dampened your spirits. Oh, I find this sort of night quite stimulating. Yes, I... I suppose you do. The unleashed fury of nature. All that sort of thing. Personally, I find the unleashed fury of nature rather disturbing. Did you have a nice time tonight, Kit? Did anything exciting or, or interesting happen? Well, let's see. Paul and I sat through a double feature. <laughs> That's not necessarily exciting. Simply requires endurance. I suppose you stopped off for something to eat. Oh, no. No, we went back to Paul's house and talked for about an hour. How is Paul, by the way? Oh, fine. He asked about you. Did he? And what did you tell him, Kit? Uh, look, uh, what's the matter with you, Lisa? I seem to detect a chill in the atmosphere, and I, I don't quite get what it's about. You have no idea? No, of course not. All I know is that you were feeling very cheerful and agreeable when I left this evening. Well, I might as well tell you, Kit. The fact is, I... I went over to Paul's tonight. Oh, you did? Well, what a pity we missed you. But you didn't miss me, Kit. Well, that is, I didn't miss you. It was after you'd gotten back from the movies. Oh. Well, for heaven's sake, why didn't you come in? I couldn't. Well, why not? I saw something. <laughs> You saw something? Yes. Well? You know what I'm talking about, Kit? <laughs> no, I can't say that I do. I remember everything that happened between me and Paul quite well, and I don't doubt that you do, Kit. And as I was going to say, I hardly see... Oh, what is this other word? A third degree? No, Kit. Just a few questions I think I have a right to ask. Well, ask them then. I wish you'd stop hedging. All right. Kit. Exactly what did go on between you and Paul tonight? Oh, Lisa, are you upset because we didn't come straight back here? Paul and I got started talking about old times. About old times. I see. Yes. Is there anything wrong in that? That depends. Well, if you insist on a play-by-play -play description... I'll give it to you. We came in, walked over to the window, and sat down. Then Paul offered me a cigarette. I refused. Oh, politely, of course. You needn't try to make a fool of me, Kit. I think you're being very silly. You do? Yes. I think you're getting excited over nothing. But it is nothing to be, that's just it. Oh, I suppose I sound like any unreasonable, jealous woman to you... 
I've had qualms and doubts, and I've tried to argue myself out of them to be sensible and calm. Now, that's more like it. Sensible and calm. But tonight, when I looked through the window and saw you and Paul, the way he was holding your face in his hands, looking at you. Well, what's so shocking about that? We are good friends, you know. It gave me the feeling that you and Paul had some secret understanding that I know nothing about. And it doesn't seem fair somehow, considering how things stand. I don't quite know what you mean by how things stand, Lisa. As to there being some special understanding between Paul and myself, I freely admit it, it's true. We were, after all, close friends a few years ago in New York. And those things just don't dissolve into nothing. Apparently not. And moreover, there's no reason why they should. If you think you and Paul have reached an agreement, well and good. But what happened in Paul's past is another story. But sometimes the past affects the present. Look, Lisa, why talk to me? Why not talk to Paul if you're dissatisfied with the way things are? Because you're the one... Aren't you assuming a great deal? Besides, why can't you be content to rest on your laurels? After all, every woman can't be the first and only love in a man's life. I'm aware of that, Kit. But Paul and I were getting along so well. And then it seemed as if everything changed. And do you think I'm the witch who's spoiling your fairy tale romance? Heaven knows I've stayed out of the way as much as I could. But it's too bad I can't control Paul's feelings for you. Frankly, Lisa, I'm... I'm rather shocked. I should think you'd have more pride. I... I'm past caring about pride, Kit. When you're really in love with someone like I am, pride becomes unimportant and you see things more clearly. I even begin to understand you a lot better. Indeed. And just what does your feminine intuition tell you about me? Well, when I first saw you, I thought you were one of the most honest people I'd ever met. I trusted you, told you about myself. You seem so frank and open. But now I'm beginning to wonder. Are you? On what basis? Well, you never mention your husband. You don't seem to care about the baby you're going to have. It could be that I'm not interested in bearing my soul. No, Lisa. What bothers you is just that I'm more realistic about things than you are. But I think it's wiser not to get into a discussion of character. You see, there may be a few flaws in your own. I admit you're in a bad spot. But to use the fact that your husband deserted you in order to play on a man's sympathy... Oh, but that's not true. I love Paul. That's why I came down here. And now everything's all mixed up. Oh, you're just upset and nervous. If you'd only let things take their natural course. After all, you'll have the baby. With the baby. Without Paul, with... I mean, the reason I'm so happy about the baby is because of Paul. And with his money, he could do so much for the baby. Believe me, Lisa, I have no desire to cut in on your relationship with Paul. I think I know what you want. And I'm doing my very best to help you get it, whether you believe me or not. I don't want your help, Kit. I don't want anything from you. And I'm not going to continue living here in your house. Don't be a fool. Of course you'll stay here. Because there's nothing else you can do. Lisa Fenner felt caught, defeated. As she turned and walked heavily upstairs to her room, the storm which had been gathering strength finally burst in all its fury. Kit sat before the fireplace. She knew Lisa wouldn't leave. She had to protect her child. And Lisa's staying with Kit's protection, too. She saw that now. Yes, tonight she had learned something from Lisa that would give her an out in case things went wrong for her. Kit Mead was prepared for any eventuality, except the one which is actually to occur. The doorbell rings, and outside, waiting in the rain, Ben Calvert stands with his wife, the former Jesse Ward. <laughs> 